Joining us here uh, in the studio, a very special guest. Many of you will already be uh, familiar with him because he does host a show here at WMNH, although that's not the main thing we're going to discuss today, although we'll probably talk about that a little bit. Uh, but uh, the great Rob Azevedo is here. Hello. Hello. Is it uh, weird being on the couch? No, actually, I like being on the couch. It's nice to be the person being interviewed every once in a while. There I get go. to sit back. And I'm going to hold up the book here for uh, people watching on Facebook so you can see it. So this is Rob's book. I read this last night, most of it last night, and I finished it this morning. Notes from the Last Breath Farm, A Music Junkie's Quest to Be Heard. So here it is. And uh, I, I really love the book, Rob. Thank and, you. Um, you know, it's it's a light read, so I was able. Plus, sure. I, I I read quick, but uh, but it's it's the kind of book once you start it, you you kind of want to just keep going. You know what I Good mean? Good deal, it's, man. That was half the that was half the uh, point. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we already have a call. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, welcome to Matt Connerton Unleashed. Who's this? Oh, hey, this is Ayak. I want to say hi to uh, both you fellas and uh, wish you a happy Thursday Thursday. And I'm going to be uh, listening to the. Uh, to the whole show, and I'm uh, looking forward to uh, your interview. I know that voice. So, uh, That's Mr. Show. Eric. <laughs> Easy G, yes. Hey, Eric, how you doing, pal? Good. That was a great. Uh, that was a great show the other day at the bookery. Even oh. though I wasn't feeling the best, I, well, I came out and uh, saw your show, and you had all the musicians in there. And that, I think that Jasmine Hand girl is going to be playing Jasmine Man? at the, um, the Pride Festival coming up on the uh, the fifteenth. What, what? Which festival is it? That girl he had, Jasmine, I think. Oh, uh, oh yeah, Brooklyn Jasmine's United. the best. Jasmine's the best. And she's she playing plays... at the, uh, the Pride Festival. Oh, the Pride the, uh, Fest, yes. On the 15th. Yeah, she is. I know for sure she is. I think she's the headliner. Yeah, I know all, all those people you brought in. I know you brought a lot of magicians. They, uh, <laughs> they, were, all, they were all very... Oh, excellent. yeah, they're, they're my I'm gonna, gang. I'm going to have one, I'm gonna have one of them on, my, uh, on that uh, little show called uh, Peter White Morning Show. Got Katie Dobbins coming in August 5th. I think they, Dobbins, I love Kate. I, I think they're actually musicians, is the Magi term. I don't think they're, I, don't, I didn't see anyone doing magic. Well, what they do, that Jasmine <laughs> man, she, she pulls some magic out of her mouth, that's for sure. Uh, I would have let yeah, it. So I'm looking forward to the show, so uh, have a great uh, interview there, Matt, and uh, I'll be listening. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Bye, Eric. <laughs> I, w I would have let it go if he'd only said it once, but he said it twice. He said magicians. <laughs> Pete would have been all over that. Oh. Pete would have been chewing on him oh, for that. I know, I know. Uh, we've been giving uh, Eric a very hard time lately. But uh, the phone line is open, so if anyone has a question or a comment or anything at all for Rob uh, while he's here, 603-250-6007 is the number to call. 603-250-6007. Or you can always chime in in the Facebook live chat as well. Uh, I see Fred Bone again there. Hi, Fred. Fred sent me that song to play to open with uh joshua howard is in there uh Rhonda, christian collins ricky huber dr jeff cassell bob burl so we got uh we got a full uh a full house which is wonderful but uh yeah that was a great event at the at, at the bookery and have you been have you been doing others as well have well, you been making I, the rounds i've done i've done one up at new england college in concord we did the one at the Bookery, which was outstanding. It's yeah. such a great store yeah. and um, great support down there. And the mayor showed up out of nowhere, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. was cool. And by the end of the night, I know you had to leave. You had things to do. But the mayor was crying at the end of the night. Was uh, she? Oh, yeah, man. Full tears. Oh, wow. Yeah. I loved it. Oh, wow. Um, so mission accomplished. And then tomorrow night, I'll be doing a, another reading down in Exeter at the Word Barn at 7 o'clock with two other poets. So that's a pretty big thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, the Word Barn's uh, some some real heavy hitters head down there. So I was very uh, thankful to be asked to go down there. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I heard, uh, and I did hear, by the way, your interview with, uh, the, the interview Peter White did with you, and I, I thought that was great. Oh, thanks. Pete's awesome. And uh, absolutely. And I, I got to tell you, so reading this, I mean, it was some of it was hard for me only in the sense that I I really could relate to a lot of what you have gone through. Um, the the stuff about you know you're you're talking about your childhood a lot in yeah. this and and um, I myself like growing up I was very much an introvert mm -hmm. and I was just terrified of everybody. Okay, you know, and yeah. I I could really kind of relate to a lot of that that insecurity and that oh, yeah. feeling of not fitting in and yeah. Well, you know, I did my best to fit in. I think I I ran the middle ground. You know, I I was your typical kid that was uh, that was fitting in, but not fitting in, 
but mostly terrified on the inside. Mm-hmm. Constantly yeah. had a stomach ache, man. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I, I, you know, in my my house, my mother and my father didn't have the best relationship. If you looked at it from the outside, we lived in a big brick colonial. We lived adjacent to a golf course. Um, father did well, but the inside of the house was sort of could be a uh, an inferno of emotion in there. Yeah. So you kind of just had to duck and cover <laughs> and uh, kind of. Fig, you know, hopscotch around whether my mom was in a good mood, whether my father was ready to, uh, you know, blast off with holy hell. Yeah. And and you talk in here about what your mom used to say to you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what, what, is, what is it that she, well, would, she my would, mother say? would say to me all the time? Uh, who do you think you are? Right. And the only acceptable answer was nobody, mom, nobody. And she would reassure me and she'd say that you're damn right. You're nobody. And don't you ever forget it. Yeah, and it always stuck with me, and I I never liked it. I, I remembered yeah. it as my teens. I remembered it into my into my twenties. You know what I yeah. mean? Um, yeah. And uh, and it wasn't that I wanted. I needed to be somebody like a number number one. Mm-hmm. I just needed to be something more than a nobody. Right. So I think that's sort of what has motivated me to. Uh, to be heard, like I talk about my a quest to be heard, mm-hmm. uh, to be a writer, uh, and then I got into making short films. That's another reason. Uh, I think you know uh, another reason why. And then then when I got on the radio, when I got a radio gig about eight years ago, you know what's the reason? You know we could ask anybody who's in this forum. I could ask you. We could sit here like, why are you on the radio? Why do you feel a need, Matt, to be on the radio? There's something that fulfills you about it yeah there's something that gets you up out of your uh, out of your apartment this is like what i say too gets up, us off the couch gives us a sort of self-satisfaction i think yeah uh, 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 something about uh, contributing right um and i don't know if that's right for you but that is that's it for me no, I mean that. I, I think that is it, and I know for me too, it's almost kind of a, a form of therapy, you yes. know, because I got a lot going on in my head, yeah. and, and here, and and you know, it, it's such a blessing to to have the opportunity to do a, a show here where you know uh, th- they pretty much leave us alone. That's right. You know, it's there's the no one trying to control our content, no. so we can do what what we want with our time here, and it's it's really, um, it you know, it, it's really wonderful, and that's a big part of why I do it. Uh, oh, Kyle Heavey, uh, host of Off the Mark Sports here at WMNH, is in the Facebook live chat. Love that dude. Good, yeah. good guy. Yeah, absolutely. Kyle says, keep on rocking in the free world, yeah, gentlemen. Baby. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Wayne Noel is in there as well. Uh, Rhonda says, yep, no one knows what goes on behind closed doors. You are not alone, buddy. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank ben, you. And Ben Dion, uh, another one of our hosts here at WMNH, also is in the Facebook live chat. He's a great guy. So absolutely. Yeah, no, we have a great crew here. We're very fortunate. We do. We're very lucky. And like I was talking to Pete about it, and you and I, me, you, Pete, Kyle, Ben, we all know, uh, you know, we have great management here. Yes. You know, I work at a, co- a couple different stations, and I can tell you, I do, it's a totally different ball game down here. I never hear from the other station manager. Yeah. Uh, and we it's not like we need to hear from um, Joe or uh, everybody else. It's just they leave us, let us do our thing. Yes. And but we honor but we respect that they let us do our thing. Right. And we don't act like clowns about it. Right. Right. You know, we and we're trying, like I said to Pete, I, I said, uh, when I listen to Pete in the morning, which I do every day and I listen to you in the afternoon and stuff like that, we approach things as if we're making Howard Stern money. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, and it's not about the money. It's about creating something that's going to entertain the listeners, inform the listeners. And if we get lucky, influence the listeners. You right. Know? Yeah. No, that's a, that's a, a great way of putting it. So we should talk about Granite State of Mind a little yeah. bit, too, because that's, uh, of course, Fridays at 6 p.m. here. Yeah. Yep. And, and then- Thursday nights. uh Seven o'clock at WKXL one hundred three point nine up in Concord. Okay, yeah, same, same stuff. You know that radio station. It goes up into the lakes and up eighty nine, yeah. and then obviously here we spread out down one hundred one, down ninety three, out towards uh, you know the Bedford area and all that. And uh, it wasn't always on KXL, right? It, it wasn't always on. It started out eight years ago on WNHN ninety four point seven FM. Uh, another even smaller radio station, um, and I got a three. I just I was down my basement one night, and uh, I get these things in my head in the basement, which is easy to do when I'm down there. And I just said, I think I want to try to be on the radio. And I went and pitched the uh, pr- the station manager there, and uh, he gave me a three week tryout, 
And he said, sure, I'll give you three shows to do. Yeah. And me and my good buddy Dave Cummings, who back then I had a co-host uh, for about a year. And it's been eight years later. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's I love it. I still love it. Yeah. It, you know, like Friday nights down here, it's like my favorite hour <laughs> of the week, man. Yeah, yeah. The work week is over. I've got somebody coming in to entertain me. Yep. And I leave here and I pop over the Wild Rover after and it's game time, you know? And you didn't have any experience, right? Prior None. To, prior no, to starting, zero. Yeah. Zero. It's like, I wish... You know, I wish I had done um, – I, di- I did a lot of writing in college, but I wish I had worked at the radio station. Yeah. But I didn't get the balls to do anything about it, like a lot. You know, here I am. I got all the balls in the world when I'm in the 40s, right? But sure. where was I when I was a teenager oh, in my 20s? That's another thing about you that I got from the book that I can really relate to. Tell me. Because like I, I often describe myself as a late bloomer in yeah. a lot of ways. Yeah. And I kind of, I, I don't think you ever used that phrase and that term. I would in never the book. call myself a late bloomer. What I was was a petrified, uh, <laughs> I don't know, a thorny, petrified. Yeah. I was, uh, you know, on the outside, I was like either too cool for school to do something like that. <laughs> right. Or, but in truth, I was just a terrified little prick that, um, that just didn't have the balls to do it. Right. Uh, right. You know, when I see my kids, I got, I have a daughter that's at Central High School. I have a son who's up at Hillside heading to Central next year. And all the things that I've seen them do from be in band, be in orchestra, try out for this, you know, I didn't do that stuff. I yeah. wanted to do the stuff, but, I didn't have the guts to do the yeah, stuff. I can relate. And, and now I wish I was in band, man. I, I know, wish yeah. I was in orchestra. Yeah. Uh, I wish I had gone into drama and acting. Yeah. I would, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wish I worked for the AV department is in the junior high. So, you know, audiovisual department. I didn't do that. So, right. you know, that's not my mother's fault. That's not my father's fault. That's my fault. Do you ever feel like, because now you, uh, you know, you've been very prolific with, with, with everything that you've done. Like, reading the book, I didn't realize like all the films and everything yeah and i didn't i didn't know much about i mean i kind of had an inkling but i i didn't know a lot about your career in that realm I, do you ever feel like you're kind of making up for lost time in a certain sense um trying to push yourself and you, you know what no because n- i don't do anything that i don't want to do i don't rush anything that i want to do now yeah um I do only what I want to do. Yeah. You yeah. know, if I want to sit down at night and go write a column down the basement, I go write a column if something's with me. Yeah. I don't stress too much about it. Yeah. If, I, if an idea comes to me to make a short film, whether it's a documentary, a rockumentary, or just a short film, uh, then I go down the basement and write it. After I write it, I uh, will um, – then I'll start thinking about, all right, how am I going to make this a movie? Yeah. How, where am I going to get the $2,000 to make this a movie? Where am I going to find the guy to shoot it and edit it? Because I don't know how to do any of that. Yeah. Um, nope. I'm at the uh, I'm at the pace that I want to be at. I'm doing it. Um, and the, the book was sort of like the final thing that I needed to check that off. Since I started writing in college, I always wanted to be – I always wanted to walk into a bookstore mm. and see on the binder – as a veto, oh, I don't yeah. even know what the you know whatever the title was going to be. Right, and right. I never thought, never in a million years that I think it was going to happen until it did happen. Yeah, that's you know? that's pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, good for you. And that's the best way to create, right? To to create because you want to. Yeah, not because you have to. Yeah, not because you have to meet a deadline or or do something that someone's hired you to do that maybe you're not that into. Yeah. You know. you know, you know, Matt, I talk to people about it and they're like, you know, how do you do all this stuff? You know, I get these ideas that people will say to me, man, I get these ideas in my head. Right. But I don't do anything with them. Mm. And I say, well, shame on you, man. This is well. And this is because I learned it. Yeah. I say, shame on you. Those ideas come to you for a reason. They come knocking on your door. Right. And now it's up to you to act upon it. Like you probably wanted a radio show at some day. You know, you're very much into politics. You're well versed on politics. And here comes an opportunity at WMNH. Right. Yeah. yeah. You could have. Uh, Kick the can down the curb and not done it, or you could have said you could have grabbed the opportunity oh, yeah. Yeah. and taken it, and right. you did, and you ran with it. Um, so, uh, yeah, not making up for lost time. And uh, so people say to me, people say to me, "Oh, I wish I did this. I wish I did that." How do you do it? You just do it, right? Right. And and uh, I hate the word journey. I can't stand. I wait, wanted wait. To, I wanted to ask you about that because I heard you you say that uh, during your conversation with Peter. Yeah, well, but but you I, never really explained. I'm not a big fan of the word journey. Uh, I think it's overused. Mm. I, I can't stand when I 
you know, if I see on Facebook or somebody writes, uh, uh, oh, you've been on such a journey. I just think it's such an easy is it, word. Is it too zen? Is it too? No, what? no, it's too flat. It's too, too, it's almost too suburban. Yeah. It's almost too, yeah, it's almost too suburban. Yeah. Uh, it's not a journey, you know, because there's, so people will say to me, um, you know, you're on this journey. And I'm like, you could be on the same quest as I am. I mean, and there is no time limit. There's no deadline. There's not a bell that's going to go off and say, oh, yourself, you're fulfilled <laughs> now or you've you've done right. it. You know what I mean, Matt? Yeah, there isn't yeah. the the what you get out of it, the satisfaction that you get out of doing anything, whether it's in the arts or radio or uh, physical activity is your quest. And it's mm-hmm. the actuality of doing it. Right. That's where you get your satisfaction. That's where you. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, and stop me if I'm talking too much, but I, like, no, no, if I'm in the, all. if I'm in the basement and I'm writing a column, right. I get, I love to take a shower after because all I'm doing, I get such satisfaction. I get to go upstairs and I'll be like, all right, I'll edit this tomorrow morning. And then I'll, I sit in a shower and I feel good. Yeah. I feel fulfilled. <laughs> I feel like I accomplished something. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Did you shower a lot after the, the uh, column that you wrote in, in uh, college? Uh, oh, spanking it. <laughs> People will have to read the book to know exactly what. It, well, yeah, no, you can. I don't know how much you want to say yeah. about it, but oh, it was a, you know, it was a tongue in cheek. Uh, you know, back in the early '90s, before there was websites like uh, Barstool dot com. Uh, yeah, you know, we're all you know. You get, I I was writing that sort of column. Yeah, you know, I would have fit in right in with mm. the, with the bar stools. You know what I mean. And a lot of it that I wrote, whether it was about sex or whether it was about masturbation or, you know, drug use and stuff like that, I, I cringed when I went back and read the articles when I was researching and writing for the book. Ah, I cringed at what I wrote. I was, it was a hard, it was a very popular column, um, popular <laughs> to the point where, you know, there was an edit. People, people couldn't stand it. Adults couldn't stand it. <laughs> Students loved it. Uh, the president of the college had me in and he said, you got to stop doing this. And I was just like, yeah, really not in the mood to hear it, and it's it's, it's I got the legal right to do it, and I'm thinking, God, later on I say I'm such an a hole, uh, <laughs> yeah, and then an editor up in Lincoln ran portions of it, trying to you know chastise me. Yes. what happened to her, man? She lost so much business. The people went crazy. How dare you print reprint this stuff? Right. Um, but uh, yeah, so I did. It was called spanking it, and um, so you figure it out, and um. <laughs> uh, there's a great story in there about some uh, some guys at the college who were upset with you. Oh yeah, man! I, you know, <laughs> oh, oh yeah, re, re, you know, football players would. I was uh, in the weight gym, and I I used to bust. I used to go after the people who could take who I would think could take the bu- busting. Right, right. I wouldn't go after you know. I wouldn't go after the little man. I'd go after the big man. Exactly. And, and, and yeah. I always knew you know it would cost me a beat in here and there. Um or. You know, something like that. So these guys, they were like, did you read what this kid wrote about us? You know, and um, I'm sitting there and I'm like lifting and I'm like, I was the one who wrote that about you. And sure enough, they found out it was me, but they didn't do anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, which we're happy about. That yeah. They, uh... <laughs> Kyle uh, says in the Facebook live chat, we just need Peter to, Peter to join the Facebook view uh, to be all together for the first time in a while. Oh, that's true. Yeah, if Peter were in here, we'd have all the hosts on uh, on here at once. Oh, hello to uh, Rocky Huber, who says, very inspiring. And uh, hello to Frank Potato. Frank and I used to be in a band together uh, nice. many years ago. So very cool. Are you, are you already writing something new? Because I also remember in your conversation with Peter, you were saying you were already looking for the next book. I, I'm, I know. Um, my, my publisher... Uh, George Gears up in Concord, Plaid Swede Publishing, right after, you know, because I finished writing the book about eight months ago, nine months ago. Yeah. And I'm always looking for a project. So, like, within two weeks after we had coffee and he wanted to talk about sales and stuff like that, and I have a number I have to hit, which is good. Um, and I said, all right, you know, I'm ready to go again. I said, you know, I want to send you a little treatment of what, uh, you know, uh, I want to write next. I want to call it Notes from the Last Breath Farm, Volume 2, uh, Queen City Blues. And I want it all about Manchester. Yeah. And he's like, he just looked at me. He's like, are you serious? And he's like, <laughs> he's like, you're not much for living in the moment. And I'm like, no. I'm like, I'm ready to go, George. And he's right. like, yeah, I'm not. I want to see how books, I want to see if this one sells. Oh, and I'm like, all right. And yeah. so as a, you know, 
my day job, you know, I, I've worked for a hundred years uh, selling home medical equipment. So I'm a numbers guy as it is. You give me a number, George, and I'll hit that number. Yeah. So I think I got to sell like 500 or something books. And I think we're already almost, uh, well, halfway past that. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. Because so, the book's only been out for about a month. Month. About okay. Month, month to six weeks. Yeah. 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 That's uh, no, that's that's fantastic. Um, and can you, can you explain the, the title? Because that's, I'm sure people are very curious. Notes from the Last Breath Farm. That is literally a title that I have had in my head uh, since early 2000s, I would say, probably 2005. And I remember when I came up with it. I was. Uh, it's a Warren Z. Notes from the Last Breath Farm. Okay, all my favorite books, Pete, uh, I mean, uh, Matt, have been notes. Notes from uh, The Underground by Dostoevsky. That's one of my favorite books of all time. Uh, notes from Cold Harbor by Frederick Exley, one of my favorite books. So I wanted my book to be titled, if I'm going to do this one time, then I want the exact title. I want it to, yeah. you know, so I wanted it to be called Notes. Last Breath Farm comes from a, a line of a Warren Zevon song called Detox Man, Detox Mansion. I've gone to Detox Mansion way out on Last Breath Farm. I've always mm, liked that. I yeah. figured, okay, so last breath's got to do, sort of goes with last gasp, last chance. Right. Okay? Right. Farm, we're in New Hampshire. It's bubolic. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I want a kind of <laughs> rural rural title. So I just said, okay, let's call it Notes from the Last Breath Farm. Yeah. My publisher was, you know, anything I said, uh, he was like, let's do it. Yeah, yeah. And obviously you were able to talk him into the uh, – the cover, because I remember also you said on Peter's show that he said he had never put out a black book. Never put out a black book. That's Brendan. Um, oh, yeah. Brendan is, Brendan is phenomenal with, with graphics. Yeah. He did all the logos for the shows mm -hmm. here. And, yeah, Brendan's amazing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the publisher was like, so, you know. I should uh, I'll hold it up again so people watching can see the. Yeah, see the thank cover, you. yeah. Thank you. I don't know how closely they can see it, but although I did I did post a picture of it earlier too yeah, on thank the, you very much. on the Facebook uh, page. Yeah, yeah, I wanted it to be black. I wanted it to be black. One of my uh favorite books is uh, by f the French writer uh Celine and uh I've read his book uh, long I think it's a Long Day's Journey into Night or that might have been um Anyways, he's got a book something like that and his cover was black. Yeah. Sort of just like this and it always stood out to me. And you know, Pete said, which and other people have said, they said, man, that stands out from all the other books, a black book. So yeah. there it is, my black book. Yeah, you yeah. Know? <laughs> Not the kind of one I, I got, uh, I like, but that's that's my black book. <laughs> so there's a lot of great stories in here. There's one, um, there was one that really uh, bothered me that this happened to you. And it, it just, I bring this one up because it relates to something. You know, I, I talk on the show a lot about the war on drugs. Uh-huh. And there's a story in there about what happened to you in Nova Scotia. On, in Nova Scotia, that f for me was upsetting on multiple levels. I mean, partly because I feel badly that you went through that sure. on a personal level, and yeah. also too, more broadly, I feel badly that anybody has to go through that. Uh, that was rough. That was yeah. rough. Well, my wife, um, my wife, our very first day of our honeymoon, we describe we decide to um, head up to Nova Scotia, go to Portland first, Portland, Maine. And take the boat over to Nova Scotia and then just tool around Nova Scotia for our honeymoon. Just drive around. Uh, she brought, what did she do? Every once in a while, I'll imbibe. So, uh, <laughs> she brought a, uh, she brought a joint for me, surprised me. And I'm like, oh, outstanding. This is great. <laughs> um, so the night before, I think I ripped into it a little bit, um, on the boat and then I tucked it away and we're getting off the boat in Yarmouth, uh, Maine, uh, Yarmouth, Nova Scotia and the, we see the, uh, border Patrol going to cars, you know, left, left, mm -hmm. left. But they pointed to me, and they went right. And they pointed me right over to a building, just randomly. Yeah. Just me and my wife. Um, and then we get there, and they're like, we gotta, we're going to go through your car. Random search. And they found some stems. They found some seeds uh, in there. Mm -hmm. So they're like, okay, this is what we're doing. They take us both in the office. A couple female Border Patrols take my wife, stripper naked, if you believe that now, yeah. now uh, me, I didn't care about getting naked. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it wasn't the first time I'd been arrested either. So I wasn't, <laughs> um, I wasn't, I was felt horribly that she's in that situation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Ultimately they let us go, Yeah. but we both got strip searched. Uh, yeah. and she's a pretty mellow lady, um, without having to imbibe, believe it or not. Uh, and I'm like shaking. I leave and I'm shaking all the way to like around the coast, heading to our hotel. And yeah. I'm like, she falls fast asleep. But yeah, we got, 
strip search, the whole car stripped, but they never found the rest of that joint, man. Right, The yeah. joint was down in a corner pocket of something, and I see them reaching in there, and I'm like, good Lord, man, what are they yeah. going to do? It's Friday. It's flipping Friday. If they dare lock us up for this, we're going to be there Friday, Saturday, oh, yeah. Sunday, yep. and then I'm not going to, you know, then Mondays, maybe you go to a court for a joint. I don't know how it works in Canada, Yeah. Uh, so, but they let us go. And this was, you know, quite a few years ago, too. This was so. in 19, um, no, in the year 2000. So, Very- yeah. So, however it worked then, nearly two decades ago, is what you probably would have been in more trouble than you would be now. Yeah, probably. Cer- Very cer- much so. Certainly. Actually, they went full legal, didn't they, Canada? I don't know. I think I think they did. So actually, All I know so is now, that New, New Hampshire hasn't somehow. So in a way, I mean, it's like on the one hand, this was obviously a terrible experience, but at the same time, it could have been much, much worse. It could have been worse, <laughs> and I got a great story out of it. Right, so. right. That's true. So, That's true. I thought that was one of the most compelling things in the book. Really? But, Thank you. Yeah. But uh, but again, too, for me, I mean, everyone's going to get something different out of it. For me, it was an it, it surrounds an issue that I care a lot about. So. Uh-huh. Drug enforcement? Yeah. I just, I hate, I, I'm so against the war on drugs, and uh-huh. I, I call it the government's war against the American people, or in this case, you know, maybe the Canadians' war against uh, yeah. the American people, sure. <laughs> you know. Um, but uh, the other th- thing, too, I wanted to uh, mention is, um, because you talk a lot about Hunter S. Thompson, yeah. and um, I'm not as familiar with him as it sounds like Peter is. But I just, um, do you remember the show, uh, this is one of those odd memories, no one remembers this except me, but maybe you'll remember it. Do you remember the show Friday Night Videos? No. You don't? Okay. On MTV? No, it was on NBC. Um, you're, uh, you're a few years older than I am, but we're, we're basically the same generation. So it would have been on, yeah, like in the 80s. Mm-hmm. It was it was on NBC on Friday nights. It was called Friday Night Videos. And they would have a couple of celebrity hosts okay. every Friday night, and they would introduce the videos. Okay. Um, the show was kind of pointless because MTV existed, mm-hmm. but for some reason NBC did this. There's a, there was an episode of Friday Night Videos. I'll never forget it as long as I live. It was Hunter S. Thompson. Really? And Keith Richards. Oh, yeah. I know that interview. You do? Oh, I know okay. the interview. Yeah. I, and I think it was from Friday Night Videos. And it's just so funny because I just remember as a kid watching it, and it kind of seemed like they were in on the joke. Because clearly the joke was, it was very difficult to understand either one of them. Oh, that's no joke. That neither, okay, so I, I know the video. There, there, I don't, you do, okay. I, I don't think there's a piece of uh, footage of Hunter Thompson that I haven't seen. Oh, okay. Uh, number one. So I know that, uh, I know that um, Keith went out to uh, Woody Creek. Owl Farm, where in Colorado, where yeah. it comes to, and it was like, um, you know, the meeting of the two mad scientists. You yeah. know, one guy's a writer, both, you know, heavy alcoholics, both yeah. big into drug use. Right. No, that was no, that was no, neither one of them could talk. And Hunter Thompson, he was even worse. He was just mumbled through the whole thing. And uh, maybe it was just funny to me because I was a kid. I remember watching it and thinking it was funny because I couldn't understand what either of them were saying, but yeah. they understood uh, yeah, yeah, each other yeah, 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 yeah. they clearly understood each uh-huh. other even though i couldn't so it was like it was just very very funny to me oh yeah yeah well you you know that's like if you can get well if you could get back in the day if you could get hunter thompson and keith richards in the same room that's a party yeah you yeah. know what i mean that that is a party absolutely uh, yeah but yeah i was uh, i got big into hunter thompson when i w- worked at the school newspaper in plymouth i went to plymouth state yeah um and i was made you know uh, a de facto editor, uh, editor of uh, the arts and entertainment section. So I would get these books sent to me. It was yeah. great. So one day I pick up a book. I used to have to write these little reviews, and it's this, uh, in, this book of interviews with uh, a woman do, doing a book. Ex girlfriend of Hunter Thompson's did a book on him. Oh wow, he was still alive. And I was like, I don't know. I was captivated by it. And then I read Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and I was like, My God, you know, um, I didn't even know people were allowed to write like this. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so that's pretty much when I really got into writing. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, Rocky Huber says, uh, LOL, he looks like the usual suspect in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny says, what was the hardest part to write? Uh, I would say the first, very first lines because i you know once i was, once I wrote those lines, um, uh, who do you think you are? Nobody, mom, nobody. Uh, you're damn right you're nobody and don't you ever forget it. I knew once I wrote those that the book had started and I knew I was in cruise control after that yeah. because I had it. I just I, I just knew that was a great opening. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I had my hook. But then you have to write 
about your mom the way I, I did, and it, yeah. was, it, and it was hard. It was, it, it was, I had to be honest. I had to be honest with the reader. I had to be honest with myself. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to give, my mother had some very tough traits. She was a fiery, hardcore Irish woman who could flip on a dime. Uh, she could be loving one minute and then just, you know, tear me down to shreds the next minute. So I was always on eggshells around her. And I had to be honest, and I had to write about it. I have a big family, uh, and I had to think about what the ramifications would be. Them reading that stuff about my mother, um, and my mother was um, my mother died last July. And I don't want to say I'm glad the book came out when when she had passed. Well, that's what I was wondering. Could you have written that if she were still? Alive? I would have. You would. I would have. Yeah, we would have yeah. had to. We would have had a sit down chat, and I probably would have broke her heart, but. In the book, if you read the book, it, it you got to keep reading. Yeah. Because in yeah. the beginning, she kicked my ass as a, as a kid. But like Louis, the cab driver, he just called me and him. Uh, he periodically calls me, if you know Louis. Louis Applebaum? Yeah, Applebaum. Uh, so he just called me around 3.30 just to shoot shoot the breeze. And he was like, um, your mother loved you. If, uh, if, if she, okay, think about Robbie. If she didn't say that stuff to you, where would you have been? And uh, you're right. Yeah, You're right. Maybe yeah. I, I wouldn't have been motivated to do some of the things that I do. Right. Uh, so that was the stuff about my mom was very, very hard. Yeah. And um, but, you know, it is what it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. The writing game is you know, it's it's easy if you can just make it up or you just do the um, the real fluff stuff. I don't know. You know, I, I could yeah. have painted a, a much softer picture, but I painted the picture that was real. No, but to, but to be fair, uh, you do. I mean, you you, you know, you you explain how you kind of never knew, like when you woke up in the morning, what it was going to be with your mom no and doubt. whatnot. But then you also say, though, but but she was a great mom. I, I think the line you use is you said, "Don't let me sell it any other way." She was. Don't she let was me a, sell it any other she way. She was a great mom. Yeah, yeah, and I can be a bit of a prick myself. You know what I mean? It's. Um, my mother fed me. She bred me. Yep. I never went without clothing, without three meals a day, uh, without haircuts, um, all of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, for her to be as tough as she was uh, verbally, she must have had her own host of problems sure. that I was too young to understand. Right. You know, she was a mother there. She was in her 30s. I know 30s aren't easy on any mother. Yeah. She had three other kids, uh, her and my father. Um didn't have a very loving relationship. So, you know, I, you know, I was getting some shrapnel. And yeah. and I later learned, you know, I figured out when I was older that, oh, all, those, those, those shots that she was, welcome to Manchester. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, those shots that she was taking at me probably weren't even intended for me. You know, um, they were probably intended for my father, but she didn't right. either have the guts to say it to him. You know, and as a parent now... As a parent now, I have my own kids, and, and sometimes when I'm I'm ripping into my own kids, right? Sometimes when I'm ripping into my own kids, I sometimes wonder, am I yelling to them about what they did, right. or am I yelling about something else? Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Am, I, am, am I am I misdirecting it, and I'm just using them as a punching bag? Uh, for something else because... Well, yeah. Well, some of that's human nature, right? I yes. mean, people do that anyway, even outside of parenting. Just in any kind of relationship, people will take things out on other people. do that. Yeah, I yeah. Think bosses do that. Everyone does it. I mean, it doesn't make it okay, but it's something we all do and we're all guilty of to right. some extent. So. Um, and your, da your dad's kind of a, a tragic figure in the book. Yeah, my dad. Um, my dad, you would have never known it. He was a very... He was a, a furniture guy, delivered furniture for Jordan Marsh, downtown Boston. Um and then he said when he was downtown Boston, all he would do is unload in furniture and he would see these guys in briefcases and suits and he'd be like, I got to do that. That's what I want to dress like for work. Took an insurance test, studied his butt off, became a very successful financial planner in yeah. downtown Melrose. Had an office up there and him and my mother ended up getting divorced. He got cleaned out, cleaned out. But up until like the last month and a half of his death when he died he died of cancer very uh, quickly um when uh, my brother and my two sisters we went to find out okay what's he got he was forty five thousand dollars in credit card debt and he didn't have a penny to his name yeah this was a guy that was probably pulling six figures for 20 years yeah um and you just never know but he had too much pride 
uh, to let us on. He put a little bit of money away as an inheritance and stuff like that. Um, but we had no idea that he was plum broke at yeah. 70 years old. Yeah. And it um, – Oh, it broke my heart, man. Yeah. I still haven't touched his inheritance money. I, I have it still. He's been dead for maybe 10 years, and I still have that $15,000 sitting in an account somewhere. Yeah. Um, I don't know why. I just haven't touched it. Um, well, you said in the book, too, like you haven't. You, you still have his number in his your number phone. His right on my cell phone. Yeah. Yeah, I still can't delete that. And me and my father got my, – he was a tough guy, too. He, you know, he, he, was a, he was a hothead, too. Um, but for some reason, me and him got along pretty well. Yeah. You know, I understood, um, I, I understood him. I understand. I think he had a tough childhood. Yeah. Uh, he had a tough mother. Um, he had a brother who died, uh, an older brother that died, um, very young in high school or something like that. And his mother used to make him when he was a young kid, carry his lunchbox in the same way that his brother did and wear his collar up the way that his brother did. And she would see him walking down the street going to school in East Cambridge, and she would yell down, Bobby, put your collar up like Al did. Put your lunchbox in your hand like Albert did. Wow. Uh, yeah, man. No kidding. Yeah, a lot of, lot of mental mojo going on in the Azevedo household. Yeah. And yeah, we're yeah. all a little touched. Yeah. Um, well, Rob, I, I know you have to go soon. What, I appreciate it, Matt, so oh, much for having me on. Oh, I'm, I'm so happy that you were uh, that you were able to come in. And uh, is there anything you, you want us to know that we didn't uh, talk about? Well, uh, that uh, Notes from the Last Breath Farm, the book, it's available down at the bookery. And it's on Amazon.com or you can go to New Hampshire, NHBooksellers.com. And if anybody's kicking around down on the seacoast tomorrow, 7 o'clock, I'll be uh, reading from the book. Um, at the Word Barn in Exeter at 7 o'clock with a, a couple other poets. Very nice. Yeah, man. So, Very nice. But thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. And uh, it's great to be a co-host with you and all the other cats.